Hey, hello, folks. I'm Sid. Um, hi, Sid. Hi. <laughs> so um, this talk is is it's all over the place. There's a lot behind it, and um, I figured, you know, just actually literally 15 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago during the break, I was like, you know what? There's no way this talk is going to come across as anything more than an impressionistic you know, view of like many different things. So I thought I would just start in a different way and get straight to the point and then go down to the real talk that we're gonna do today and then work our way back up to the point. Uh, and this talk, by the way, is with is me uh, and also Michael Ballantyne, who is gonna be a featured artist. <laughs> so yeah. So the main point in all this is that a year ago at EmacsConf, I presented about what I see as the root cause of a lot of the problems that we face in the world at every scale. And in my opinion, it is that it is the deviation of market value from true value. And if we solve this one problem, it's the only one we need to solve. We don't need to, ta to solve poverty and you know, global warming and um, open source financing and all of those problems with the distinct solutions. Because in the end, they are going to have distinct solutions, but the only way those solutions will thrive and survive and not be swamped by, you know, competing incentives is if we solve this one problem. And there is, there are some, there's some complexity as to what that solution means and what even the problem means which um, I guess I forgot to put that other slide here, but recently I did another talk at the Foresight Institute, which is um, sort of a nonprofit that tries to help on initiatives that are undervalued, they say. And at this talk, I presented what I see as two key insights about the nature of the solution. The first insight is that value should be measurable from an economic perspective. And it currently isn't, and, economic, and economists have already given up on this. They don't consider money to measure value because there's a lot of empirical evidence that it doesn't. Um, and so the first claim is that it must in order for us to solve the problems. And the second claim, and uh, as a part of that, um, value must be measurable, but it also is we have to ask the question, what kind of value is measurable? And it turns out it's not the kind of mercantile capitalist uh, value that we use today, but a more general form, which, of which today's idea of value is a subset. And that more general form is called dialectical value, and it's measurable, and it gives rise to the second key claim, which is the origin of money. And the claim is that money should be a side effect of the creation of measurable value, okay? So that's the big idea. I think it's very important. But now we're going to come all the way back down to the lowest level of what it means for us and how language-oriented programming fits into this big picture. So Racket, as we know, is a language-oriented programming language. And uh, what that means is that it emphasizes uh, building up your language to reach the problems rather than forcing your, coercing your problems down to the level of an existing static language. And one instance of a language that is in this um, sort of concept is Qi, which we introduced at RacketCon a couple of years ago. And it is a, an embeddable flow-oriented language which just means that it's a um, language that emphasizes functional, immutable, point-free style, and it's embeddable in the sense that you don't, uh, it doesn't encourage you to write entire programs in this language. It just says if there are subclasses of the problems you're trying to solve that can be expressed well in this sort of flow-oriented way, then just embed this language in there and just solve that particular problem that way. So that was two years ago, and we've been hard at work. We've done a lot of things since then, and I want to tell you about some of those things, um, one of which is we've distilled a core language. So Qi is a large language. You can think of it as sort of a uh, generalized Turing complete version of the threading macro enclosure, and it's, it's a large language. And we've distilled the core essence of that language, which will be useful, as we'll learn later. 
Um, we've separated the languages compilation to Racket into two distinct phases, the expansion phase and the compilation phase. And we have an optimizing compiler, which we've measured to produce a speed up of you know, 3x on a functional pipeline that's about two or three stages long. And the longer, the more stages you have, the more speed up you're gonna get, so it's a linear speed up. And we know this because we have a Qi SDK now, which contains profiling and benchmarking and charts and coverage and all kinds of cool things that allow us to measure the impact of what we do. So, uh, and yeah, and there's lots of design and performance improvements as well, a lot of which have come from the community. So that's been really valuable. And all of these are coming soon in Qi 4, which we hope will be ready before Christmas this year. Um, so how have these developments been possible? And the answer is collaboration. Because no one person, I think, given the particular constraints that we operate under, you know, open source, and uh, you know, nobody getting paid and so on, which we'll get to soon, it could not have been possible to do all of these things without collaboration. And certainly, I couldn't have done all of these things by myself because I don't have the expertise um, that this community has. So um, I wanna point out that there are many aspects to this collaboration that we're talking about here. There's a technical aspect, the social aspect, and there's an economic aspect. So on the technical side, we have um, uh, Qi, well, the reason why we've been able to do all of the things that we're doing is that we have a modern DSL architecture which has not been possible before. And this is kind of a little known, uh, kind of a dirty little secret of the Racket community is that we have been talking about language-oriented programming for a long time, but the secret is that DSLs are sort of second-class citizens because they don't have some of the functionality that's available to the host language, for instance, the ability to have a compiler and so on. And that is where this new library called Syntax Spec comes in. It's what Michael is working on at Northeastern and with Matthias. And so I'll let Michael tell us the details of this new DSL architecture. Yes, kind of, maybe, a little higher up. All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm a PhD student at Northeastern. Uh, Syntax Spec is my um, dissertation work, and uh, we're sort of using Qi as kind of a case study collaboration for, for trying it out. Um, so I wanna get into that by starting with the motivations for what we need it for in Qi. Can you go to the next? Um, yeah, so the first is that we wanna make um, Qi macro extensible. Um, as Sid said, Qi started out as this one sort of huge language with lots of different features. Um, and it would be nice, it is nice to distill that language into sort of a small core language and a layer of syntactic sugar on top, sort of just like how Racket works. Um, and so we want to be able to have macros that expand from the surface language to the core, implement it that way, and also let you as Qi users sort of add those extensions yourself. So that's sort of desiderata one. Um, and then desiderata two is that we want to implement a domain-specific optimizing compile. So um, the particular example that we have up here um, is uh, stream fusion. Uh, so the syntax is probably unfamiliar, but uh, we have uh, values sort of flowing through this thread, and we're effectively doing two iterations on them. Uh, first, we're sort of filtering out, selecting only the odd ones, and uh, then we're squaring them. Um, and this particular computation is faster if we can sort of fuse that into a single loop. Um, and we want a compiler for Qi that does that. Um, one might ask why we, that is a Qi level thing and not a racket level thing. And the answer is sort of that we're cheating a little bit and that we're saying that the semantics for Qi are different and that we are making the strong assumption that all of the functions that you use with it are purely functional. Um, and so we can introduce some undefined behavior if you um, happen to choose something that isn't purely functional. So we get a little bit more power, and so we have to sort of make our own optimizing compiler to leverage that power. So uh, in order to sort of have these two desiderata together, that sort of forces an architecture where we need to put something in the middle between the cheese surface syntax and the racket language that we're targeting. 
We need an intermediate representation that we can uh, expand to and then transform, sort of do whole program analyses on that intermediate representation, uh, and then finally compile the racket. And that's really the same architecture that Racket has with an expander to core forms and then a backend compiler. So um, where syntax spec is going to come in is helping us uh, define this Qi intermediate language and define the macro expansion process uh, from the surface syntax to the core. Um, because as we know in the Racket world, um, macro expansion is sensitive to the grammar, sensitive to the binding structure of your language. So you kind of can't do it unless you understand the structure of the target language of expansion. Uh, can't do it correctly anyway. So uh, next slide. So that's what syntax spec lets, lets us write down. Uh, sort of the basic skeleton is writing down a grammar of your language. In this case, it's a grammar with one non-terminal of a flow and the different productions that we saw in the example, many more. Um, and we can annotate that grammar with extension points where we say the kinds of macros that we're allowed to use. Um, and so we've defined a new category of macro, a chi macro, that is only used in a flow. And then one more slide. Um, so then sort of the, the particular technical challenge in syntax spec is making everything work nicely with macro hygiene um, and with local shadowing of name bindings. And so we have these binding specifications um, as is a binding form in Qi that interoperates with the, work, works together with the, the threading form um, to bind the name to everything to the right. And so we have these um, binding specifications and that's what allows us to sort of generate a macro expander that understands the binding structure of the language and gets macro hygiene right. Um, so that's a story for another day, the details of that. But the, uh, the upshot for Qi is that we've now got this macro expander to the Qi core language um, and we've been able to use it to, to implement some initial optimizations. Right. So as Michael pointed out, we, Qi is able to get faster than Racket in certain specific areas because we make different trade-offs. So we're saying that we're willing to sacrifice on certain order of effects and so on and then we get a speed up for the domain that we're focusing on, which I think is what DSLs should do. So on a social level, um, you know, just purely technical collaboration could not get us um, a really healthy collaboration. And I think a social, um, some attention to the design of the social processes is also important. And that's what we've focused on as well. We have a weekly meetup, which has a public, it's, there's a public, public calendar that advertises this meetup so anybody can join. And this has been really great because it's kind of been like a circadian rhythm of the project. People always know that it's there. They're, even if they are rarely free, you know, they can always say, oh, well, today this is a chi meeting. Maybe I should go and join. And some people do. We have had people just stop by for one or two meetings. Um, it's super low key. It's low barrier to entry, uh, which we achieve by having copious user documentation as well as developer documentation, which small open source projects often ignore. But I think it's important. Um, and we also summarize every meeting that we do. And this doesn't seem especially important perhaps, but we've found that uh, by doing so, it allows people not just to see what the language is and what the project is doing and what, it, you know, what they can use it for, but also what they're working on right now. And so one of our contributors uh, pointed out that it's easy for someone new to the project to make rapidly make uh, big contributions. As, and as an example of this, uh, this is something that uh, Dominic, who lives in Prague, uh, wrote like a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago. And this is something we're working on right now where he's generalizing a particular compiler optimization that we're working on called Stream Fusion, which had the 3x speed up that we talked about, to work on multiple values instead of a single value. And we don't know if this is what we're gonna end up using, but this is what we're doing right now. And people can see that, and it's easy for someone to just jump in and say, well, you know what, if you use a case lambda here, we could probably get rid of some, uh, some cost. So, you know, Qi is structured for collaboration, and we, you know, we're, we're looking for that, and we're welcoming people to join us. Uh, it's really easy to participate. You get to work on interesting and impactful projects, and uh, it brings people together in creating value. 
which is the, the point of this talk in connection with the economic stuff that I was talking about earlier. Because if we contrast this model of working together, this model of collaboration, with the main models of collaboration that we use today, you know, we have the proprietary cor corporate model where um, you just, you're not allowed to share what you do with other people. You get told who, what to work on and who to work with. Um, and, you know, you're not allowed to share good things that you do with somebody else. Um, and then you have academia, which in some sense, you are able to collaborate and work on fun things together with people that you like. But on the other hand, you also don't have the kind of accountability that you have in the former model. And when I say accountability, I mean both for good and bad, in the sense that if you do something really valuable in academia, you're not going to be wealthy. You're just going to be some chump. But if you do something really worthless, you're still going to have tenure, and you can do whatever you want, right? So the thing is, we need people in academia to have this kind of accountability that people in industry do, because that's what's going to make science empowered in the world. Because otherwise, you have things like oil company tycoons who are controlling the dialectic of the world, and that's why global warming you know, is still a thing. Um, and then open source, of course, you know, this is another thing where the promise is, yes, you can collaborate and do all these wonderful things that we're talking about here, except you don't get paid and then nobody has time, right? <laughs> you're all doing something that you're getting paid for and then you're supposed to work on open source projects, what, on the weekends, in the evenings, it's just not sustainable. So attribution-based economics is the new alternative. It's none of these things. It sort of has the best of, it has the good parts of all of these things, you might say and the bad parts of none. Um, and yet, yeah, this, is, this is our world, right? Like we, do, we have this weird, awkward dynamic where somebody is either telling you what to do or you're forced to tell somebody else what to do. And maybe you're not the right person to do that thing, but you have to do it anyway. Maybe your brother or your sister is a better person to do it, but you can't work with them. You know, it's just a really weird and awkward dynamic that we've convinced ourselves is necessary but I want to tell you that it isn't necessary and we can do much better. Yeah, this, this is the talk that I mentioned earlier about the origin of money and stuff like that. It's soon to appear. I wish I could point you to the video, but it's not up yet. Um, so yeah, and in addition to all of these things we're talking about regarding collaboration, um, it's in fact also the case that Racket is used in the operations of Abe as well. So. Uh, Language-oriented programming turns out to be a really good fit for this social process that we use called dialectical inheritance attribution, which just means it's some kind of a social process where we're turning the opinions of people into computable data, and it's anonymized, and nobody knows the results of the process until the very end, and then you identify the sources of value in projects. And we aim to make it scalable through the use of language-oriented programming, among other things. Um, so yeah, we talked about that. And this is joint work with Ben Noble. In fact, he did most of it, uh, which is again, you know, the great thing about collaboration. Um, this is an architecture diagram that he sent, uh, which basically kind of just like shows some of the module layout and how we're using module languages to use a human-friendly data entry language instead of using something like CSV or even JSON. Um, so why does this matter for now? Locally, it means that if you give money to an open source project, if it's using attribution-based economics, then that money is gonna be distributed according to these sources of value that everyone kind of agreed upon in a transparent process that nobody controls. So that's one good reason to do it today. But at a higher level, it also means that all of these different projects are connected to one another and the sources of value are not just localized within individual projects. And the, even the notion of a project sort of like becomes more nebulous and amorphous. And for instance, the Chi project right now um, has 10% attribution to the Racket project, which means any money that comes into the Chi project, any voluntary contributions, are going to put 10% of that to the Racket project. Um, and which is kind of like what I was getting at with sustainable open source. And not, by the way, nobody in the Racket project or the T project has done any of this for the money, but we must make sure that people are fairly compensated if we are to ensure that the right ideas are empowered. 
Uh, but yeah, so this kind of like interconnectivity is a little bit like a forest, you know, where everything is connected and, you know, just everything is harmonious. At a still higher level, it um, gets at something called, that I call self-similar interest alignment, where this is our world right now, in a way. Just like feel it, you know, you don't need to know what that is exactly, you just feel it. This is our world right now. And this is what it can be with a new economic system, the one that we're talking about. Um, so, vital stats so far. We announced the pilot about a year ago, and we've actually raised some money, believe it or not. $2,900 from well-wishers and friends, just word of mouth, nothing super formal yet. Um, we funded four projects, and um, yeah, I guess one thing to point out there is that the highest attribution share on the cheap project is 32% where normally in an open source project of this size, there would be like one maintainer and that person gets all the money of the project. But that project also doesn't scale as much if there are not a lot of people working on it. So I think the slice of pie principle is important to keep in mind here, where the maintainers, you know, why should they do it if they're only gonna get 30%, right, the erstwhile maintainers? It's because there's gonna be a much larger slice, a much larger pie of which they'll have a much smaller slice. So what can you do for Abe? You can work on an A project like Chi. You can adopt Abe in your project um, and join weekly Abe workshops or Chi meetings and help appraise Abe projects using that social process that we talked about that's still in development. So follow us on GitHub. These are the various repos that we've talked about today, Chi, Syntax Spec, and some of the more Abe-related um, language-oriented programming repos. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you. This is not only a wonderful problem domain, but I'm very appreciative that you and all your collaborators have advanced something in this space. So it's, it's a wonderful thing you're doing. I have one, have you discussed things like um, somebody coming in and using bots to just try to claim as much attribution as they can, as fast as they can in order to monetize personal gain? Have you, are there corrective approaches to problems like that? Somebody trying to cheat the system? That's a good question. So currently, and in fact forever, the system is gonna be based on dialogue more than on algorithms and heuristics. Mm. So in principle, that is always robust to this kind of a thing. But in practice, you're right that, you know, at some certain scale, we're gonna to have to rely on some heuristics to inform these dialectical processes. And it's possible that some of those could be, um, you know, corrupted in some way. Like maybe somebody will do like a lot of commits or something, and if that's part of the considerations, it might skew the results. But in principle, because dialogue is the basis and not these other things, we will have a way to, to compensate for that over time. And as a second part of the question is, um, do you foresee a kind of social dependency relationship forming at scale where somebody who's trusted with the process of assigning value is necessary and knows it and uses that to their advantage? Right, so there are some checks and balances, mm -hmm. um, which for instance, currently say that one third of the people who participate in this process have to be unaffiliated at least but in fact, even all of the people who participate can be unaffiliated. And I think long term, that's what's gonna happen. The people who are the investment bankers and the intellectual property lawyers of today, they're not gonna have these kinds of jobs, but they're gonna do the same kind of work doing these kinds of formal processes. And we won't have to worry about it if we don't want to. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's a very compelling uh, alternate economics. Did you restate the original like single problem the world needs to solve? Yeah, it's the deviation of market value from true value. So if this is a method for, uh, for an organization to take incoming money and distribute it among itself and other projects, right? That's what it does today, yeah. So uh, how does that process align um, market value with true value? Because it seems like it's just kind of 
the same uh, an internal organizational structure for deciding where to spend money? Yeah, that's a great question. So it does it in two ways. The first way is that repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is. The problem statement is that the deviation of market value from true value is the problem to be solved, and yet the solution seems to be uh, uh, distributing money amongst like the organization members and the contributors. So how does that solve the problem that was a aforementioned problem, right? And the thing is that it's not up to the organization to say how the money is distributed. So that's kind of a key thing. It's like. It's not that you give money to an open source project and say, hey, here's the money, you know, give it to the people that contributed. It's, no, here's the money, and you have to adopt this system. And when you adopt the system, you're allowing people in. Like, anybody can participate in this process. And they can say, well, based on this anonymized data that we have, these are the conclusions we've come to for the following reasons. And it's not just like, it's not just like a jury system where you just say one thing and then that's it, and you have to do the same thing again the next time. Each time you do it, we build infrastructure to make that easier next time, the next time. And we're hoping that a lot of it can be automated over time. So you're proposing that like proponents of ABE will like conditionally pledge money uh, if a project adopts the system? Yes, that's, that's the way we're planning to do it in the short and medium term. In the long term, there's a very different solution regarding the origin of money, where people don't have to pay but money, but people will get paid somehow. Uh, I'm David Storrs. So you've said a couple times that the fundamental problem for everything is the deviation between market value and true value. The one thing I was hoping to hear is what is true value? How are you defining it? Because that seems like the brass tax. Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, um, it's it's very deep philosophical question, right? Um, yeah, but there's, there's many aspects. There's actually many levels of value. And the kind of value that we're talking about is called is economic value, which we're calling dialectical value. And that's not all value. So there are things that you may do that are valuable that nobody will ever be able to recognize. And that's just like a philosophical limitation that we have, and we have to, we have to live with it, and it's fine. And it actually may be a good thing. But on the other hand, we think that just because our current supply and demand heuristic is so easy and so effective, and this kind of more nebulous notion of value that doesn't conform to a supply and demand heuristic is, seems to be hard to do, we think it can't be done. But actually, there's a whole subset that's missed between what we currently recognize and what is impossible to recognize. There's a whole giant section there that we can, we can incorporate into our measuring, measurable processes. Um, and that's, that's what this true value means. It's not like the full true value, but it's measurable economic value. So just following up on that to make sure I understood that, uh, true value is not the complete true value of something because that isn't meaningful by your definitions. Right. So you're using true value to mean like market value plus this other nebulous stuff that we don't have a definition for. Yes, you could put it that way, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, I just wanted to ask a Quick question, just kind of following up with that one and the one that Sophia had earlier. Um, how is this any different from license contracts that are just renegotiated very frequently? Uh, and if so, like how does that any at any stage a separation from market value? Because it's still a market negotiation. That's what you're saying. So just comment on that. Well, <clears throat> so a lot of our existing processes are not necessarily things that we won't continue to use. So it's just I'm not necessarily saying this is something totally different. But on the other hand, the one place where it is quite different is in the scope of value that's recognizable being much larger than what it is today. So for instance, open source works today have market value of zero because it is infinite supply. You can copy it as many times as you like. So as soon as you share it openly, publicly with the world, like it's not economically recognizable anymore. I mean, that, that's simply how you're structuring an open source project. Like, if you go into the market as an open source project and you negotiate more aggressively, you're able to get more out of that. Right, so that's another thing that is something that Abe goes away from, is that it's your responsibility to negotiate for your own you know, well-being. Mm -hmm. Because if you have contributed value and 
some kind of commun communal process, like a structured, formalized process, can agree that you created value, then it is in everybody's interest for you to be empowered and for you to have money in this more but general sense of money. I understand. This, it gets down to, like, at the end of the day, you still have a negotiation. And if you go and you have an automated system that performs a negotiation on behalf of the project, you just have a level in the direction for now everybody has to negotiate the original algorithm that does this now. So how is this any different from what we have today? Really? Well, uh, like, why, why do you think that you're able to automate the negotiation process and entirely okay. remove the human aspect from that? So I'm not sure if this completely covers it, but one difference is that the responsibility of negotiation is not on you, the content value creator. The responsibility of negotiation is, it's the world. The world is going to give you if you have created value. Okay, I, I disagree, but I'll let him go. To okay, question. we can discuss more later on, yeah. Thank you, thank you, this is great uh, food for thought. Um, my question is, um, what about value detraction? You know, you've been talking about how people contribute value and get compensated for it, but every single fossil fuel company has been destroying the planet for the last 100 plus years. How are you going to account for their sort of mismatch of market value uh, to true value? Their true value is negative, but the market value does not incorporate that at all. That's a great question. And the, the simple answer is that our current notions of economic value are dominated by externalities. And that means that the majority of value that everybody can agree on through words is unaccounted for in our economic processes. So you can become a billionaire and your net value from this more general like dialectical perspective may actually be negative mm -hmm. if you happen to have contributed value in an economically recognizable way. And so in a way, all this talk about you know, re rewarding greed and stuff like that, it's that there's an incentive for, there's an incentive for self, like to find the things that are going to get you money, even if you know they're not gonna create value for the world, just because they're gonna get you money, you know? So these kinds of paradoxes will be resolved with, uh, with this. It, it in, internalizes the externalities into the economic notion of value. Cool, thank you. Uh, I think we're just at time, but um, yeah, unless there's anything else. Thank you.